Good afternoon. This is the Marion City Council work session, Tuesday, October 20th. It is now 4 p.m. And our first, uh, we have a presentation from Trees Forever, please. Afternoon, everyone. Hi. Thanks a lot for uh, allowing us to come in and present real briefly here. I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. My name is Dustin Hendricks. I've been here to present before uh, the board previously. And I apologize, but Shannon Ramsey, our CEO and founding president, is in D.C. on business right now. So I'm filling in in her stead. Um, and before I uh, start just kind of going over a few uh, brief items, I wanted to introduce our director of um, development and finance, uh, Kaisha Boyson. And she's going to bring up um, some handouts here uh, for our upcoming Arwood and Legacy Symposium, um, which the council has been gracious enough and the city has been gracious enough to uh, support us this year financially. Um, this event is coming up on December 10th. And this year, we are kind of revisiting some of our, our past themes in past years, but really trying to work towards educating local decision makers about um, the importance of the walkable and the livable city and the importance of living green infrastructure within that city. Uh, Marion certainly shines as uh, an example of a city doing pretty progressive things and, and uh, uh, fantastic things, in my personal opinion, with their green spaces and with some of the public spaces around town. Um, so we would certainly wanted to encourage folks to, uh, to attend the event if you're available. Uh, we're trying to get as many uh, local elected officials and decision makers to attend as possible, as well as staff people uh, from the cities in the area and the counties and some of the other jurisdictions. So I would hope that you'd put December 10th on your calendar and please consider attending uh, staff members as well and, and whoever works for the city here in the room, as well as attendee. <laughs> we're open to anybody. Um, and then briefly, I just kind of wanted to recount uh, just a couple projects we had uh, in partnership this year with the City of Marion. Um, the first one that I'm really, really proud to, to report on is that we planted our first urban uh, orchard here in the City of Marion this past spring and had a bunch of local folks uh, attended an event up there where we planted a um, diverse mixture of new fruit trees and a couple of bushes as well, serviceberry bushes up at Lau Park, um, just kind of on the north and west side of the, the greenhouse that's up there right now. If you haven't seen it yet, please do take a stop up there. The idea is this is just the uh, kind of the foothold. We'd like to grow a, a fairly large community orchard up there, cared for primarily through volunteer support. We're trying not to be any more of a burden on the city coffers, but we'd like to also provide new and interesting things for the residents and to attract new residents to that area. So really appreciate your partnership on that with the Parks Department. That's been a fantastic project thus far. We were actually able to also install an educational sign. So even if we're not having events out there, people as they're passing by can hopefully learn a little bit about the value of green space and also fresh fruits and vegetables in their daily diet. So it's part of the, the Blue Zones emphasis as well over the last couple of years here in Marion. And then I just wanted to uh, recount again, we, we work partnered together on the Align Energy Branching Out Grant Program again to provide even more uh, contiguous street trees along um, Tower Terrace Road. And kind of this extends the North 10th Street uh, project that we worked on a couple years ago. So we've just been expanding the, uh, the community tree canopy up north as the community grows, which we think is a, a vital part of a community to have some nice shade trees and street trees. So we really appreciate that partnership. And then finally, I just wanted to make a comment um, as a previous resident here of Marion and also somebody that goes on walks here every day um, from our office. The street trees along 6th Avenue are just fantastic. And I just wanted to, again, congratulate you on making that decision. I guess it's been about four or five years ago now since those have gone in. But they're really impactful along that streetscape. And I think moving forward, it's just going to be a fantastic uh, uptown area here. So. Look forward to continue partnership there. Again, please re recall December 10th uh, symposium. Attend if you're able. We'd love to see you there. So thank you again for the time. Thank you. Thank you. I attended last year. It was very nice. And we're always uh, pleased to have you attend our meetings. Awesome. Thank you. Great seeing thank you all. Thank you. Say, so we have, a, we have a, a little, go ahead, that's fine. We have a, a little addendum here. We have a, Tim Mooney would like to make a few comments, uh, possibly to correct some numbers on the Gazette ar uh, uh, article here a couple days ago. Go ahead, Tim. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, like Mayor said, I'm Tim Mooney, 862 Archer Drive, Marion. Uh, I guess I'm here this afternoon to discuss an extremely troubling article that I read on the front page of last Friday's Gazette. And I'm going to keep this brief as I can. So I'm going to read this uh, instead of Tom will tell you that I can babble if I don't have an agenda to go from. Uh, I guess for whatever reason, the Y project was cast in a light that was far from accurate. Uh, as you guys all know, the Imaginate project uh, brought the function and fitness project forward. It took uh, I don't know, several years of endless meetings to determine how the project would ultimately go together. Consultants were hired to determine the size of the building based on Marion's cur current and future population. 
pro forma as we were established to ensure the project would be fina financially viable. Once the information was confirmed, the site committee was formed to start looking for suitable sites for the project. Uh, it was determined early on the existing site was not big enough to handle the project, nor the expansion space required as Marion continues to grow. After a couple years of analyzing different options, the Tower Terrace Road Corridor was determined to be the best location for the project. Uh, this, this site was chosen for a number of reasons. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Uh, 20 years from now, the site will be almost directly in the center of Marion as Marion continues to grow. Uh, this was important to the selection committee to have the site uh, centered. The center of the city as we go forward, this is a, a building like the current building that will be in the community for 50 plus years. It was determined that while the White Y was primarily a Marion facility, it was noted that many of the users of the facility would also come from Northeast Cedar Rapids, Robbins, and Hiawatha, mainly because Tower Terrace Road will provide an easy access to the Y site. Council members are well aware of the retail restaurant leakage going to Cedar Rapids. This site will bring people from Cedar Rapids, Robbins, and Hiawatha right past retail restaurants, medical offices, and many other businesses that are going to grow along Tower Terrace Road between this site and Cedar Rapids. I think this is a critical point and one that not, should not be overlooked by the council. If we have a destination project that is easily accessible like this, we'll see su significant improvements in our leakage. It was determined that it was important to provide an office and commercial ground around the facility for other users that would benefit by locating next to the Y project. To that end, we have nearly 12 acres of commercial office zoning next door to the Y project. This site sits at the crossroads of Future Indian Creek Trail and Tower Terrace Road Trail. This location will allow people from all parts of Marion to use the trail system to either walk or ride their bikes to the facility. The future Indian Creek Trail, along with the current Crumbolts and Boyson Trails, create a north-south backbone for the trail system in Marion, with many other trails and bike paths intersecting them through Marion. This location will provide a trailhead for those people who choose to park at the Y and take the trail to the south side of Marion without ever touching a city street, or they can continue to downtown Cedar Rapids, or they can take a nearly 20-mile loop ride that will be created by taking the Indian Creek Trail to the Boyson Trail, the Crumbolts, to the CMR Trail, to Cedar Valley, and then back up to the Tower Terrace Road corridor, bringing them back to the Y. As the Council is aware, the CMPO Corridor Metro Planning Organization has provided funding for over $7 million to Marion to expand our trail system over the next five years, including the Indian Creek Trail to the Y site. Indian Creek Trail was funded in no small part because of the Y being located at the on the trail. As we strive to be the healthiest city in Iowa and with our Blue Zone designation in this location is easily the best location in Marion to work toward a healthy community vision. This location will also help the Y score high when, they, when it goes for his Vision Iowa grant in January because of the trails that connect to the project. Another strong driver is the Y currently sits on ground that is far more valuable if it were uh, used to its highest and best use. As you know, the Y pays no property taxes. Why would we want to shoehorn a facility on a site that is too, mal too small to serve our community today? Does not have good trail or road connections and wouldn't be used by other nearby communities. Calculations have been done, and the current Y site could easily generate over 400000 a year in property taxes on a site that is zero today. Add this to the more than $700,000 in property taxes that will be generated by the 12 acres next to the new site, and you can easily see the $6.5 million invested by the citizens of Marion could be paid back in six years. Yes, the Tower Terrace Road site has floodplain ground and roughly four acres of it will be used for, floor, for uh, fields. Clearly, this is a good use for floodplain ground and is saving the project several hundred thousand dollars 
that would be spent if the four acres were not in the floodplain. The Gazette article indicated the Y will be built in a floodplain, but the truth is it will not be. The Y's first floor uh, will be built three feet above the 100-year floodplain. I think I'd know that after all these years. So the historian and everyone, this is Tower Terrace Road, Linmar Campus this way, the reroute of Winslow Road, the heavy dark line is the floodplain that will occur after we make our improvements. This lighter dark line is the uh, Y site. The balance of the site is the available commercial and office site. Uh, the article in the Gazette also indicated that the uh, parking lots and the tennis courts and the basketball courts would also be in the floodplain. They won't be in the floodplain. I guess for a floodplain comparison, just to give people an idea of what the floodplain means, the city allows us to build at one foot above the 100-year floodplain. Um, this is our Camden Farms development here. It's duplexes. These are all walkout units. We put those two feet above the 100-year floodplain. Uh, on June 4th, 2002, we had the highest flood Marion's ever encountered. Uh, the, the highest the water got was within 14 inches of those people's floor. So we're putting the wise floor two foot above that, so 30 eight inches above the highest water has ever been in Marion. Once it was determined this site was easily the best site in Marion to place a facility, we came before the council in 2013 and zoned the ground for the Y and the zoning passed unanimously. We explained to the council at the time there was an additional large user that wanted to locate their facility next to the Y site to take advantage of the Y services the Y will offer that will complement their user services. That user is still in play today. Then in October of 2014, the Y came before the loss committee and the council to request $280,000 to hire a fundraiser and put a preliminary building plans together for the project. And, a con and the council approved those funds. Councilman Draper asked at that meeting if these plans were site specific. And the answer was yes. In June of this year, we requested the council allow us to improve the site to allow the building to be raised out of the floodplain, and that was also passed. Given that the project had come before the council on three different occasions and was supported each one, the Y felt comfortable beginning their capital campaign and Farmer State Bank started things off with a $500,000 fantastic uh, donation. Then came the article in Friday's Gazette. I would call it an ambush. It could see us be out $30,000 that our company has invested in engineering and site plan design because of the council support we had received in the three previous times we had been before council. The citizens of Marion could be out 280000 that was invested in building plans and fundraising campaign because of council support. What's even more disappointing and surprising is we have $2.6 million of agreements in place that were recently passed by the council to install Tower Terrace Road from 10th Street to this spot here. It also included rerouting Winslow Road through our site. The Gazette indicated that the city owned that site. I wish it did, but it doesn't. We own it, uh, which was, I don't know how many unfactual points that were in that Gazette article, but it was pretty disappointing to me, to say the least. I guess... Uh, 
So essentially, the taxpayers of Marion are investing $3 million to put infrastructure in place to move the city forward and accelerate growth. And, and then an article on the front page of the, Gret, the Gazette threatens to push back the return on that investment, who knows how far. Based on all these facts, I brought forward today my question is, what conceivable reason was there an article written? I'm just trying to find out what, who brought the, the what, what the reason was that the article had to be written. I mean, it's, you guys have all been up here and have all heard us talk about this project for three years. And everyone has voted yes on everything except Mary Lou voted no on the $280,000 of funding. Everything else was, everyone else voted yes. I didn't talk to anybody. So I'm not, I, you know, I'm just trying to understand how, how we get to a how we get to a front page because that article that is undermining a project that's been going on for three years and has the support of of so many people and we have the Y out trying to wait, raise money and we wind up undercutting that. All right, may I? Yeah. Are, are, are you are you through with your presentation? Yes. Okay, yeah. fine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I would like to answer yeah. a few things. When this whole project started, to my understanding, I was not yet back on the council, but there was Kirkwood, Marion High School, Linmar, well, not high school, Marion Independent, Linmar, St. Luke's, Mercy, the Y, and Marion. Seven entities uh -huh. that were going to contribute to this. Right. Now what's left? The Y and Marion. And, and I asked about... Tim, you can sit down. What it would cost to use this facility and was told that uh, basically a person would have to buy a Y membership. Now that's where I said, no. If we're putting up six and a half million dollars, the people in Marion should be able to use this facility. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a couple comments. It's, it's not that they have to buy a membership. They, they have uh, unlimited access, uh, daily access, so there is a fee involved, you know, for daily access. However, I called the uh, Gazette about this, this article, too, because, because uh, it was mentioned that uh, my, my term is up in November, and apparently uh, I think I'm going to stick around till the first of the year. So I called her about that, and I asked, where did this, where did, where did this article come from? And she says, basically, it was a... <clears throat> A, uh, a, a uh, an article uh, published uh, um, by the um, uh, Y to announce that they were having a fundraising, and I says, "Did you check any of your any of your points on this? Did you check with anybody at all?" In, in the in the in the reporter that put this out said, "No, we just took their uh, media release and published it uh, as as it is." And I says, "Well, I, I told her there were several inaccuracies on that, and I'm glad you stepped up and and didn't." Uh, Point out some of these. So, uh, it was a uh, it was an article that was uh, uh, that, that, that they should have done a lot more background on before they published it because I I, w I like I like everyone else was just shocked when it came out. So, uh, but thanks for your presentation. <laughs> so, uh, well, go uh, you have to come to the podium. You may answer that question and then we'll move on, please. And Lon, you can correct me, but the. The Y is discounting the uh, Marian, people who live in Marion. It's not free, but it's a discounted rate. Is that accurate, Ron? Yeah, that's one of the things. It's That's not uh, firmed up yet, but it'd be part of the formal agreement between us and them. And then one change that they did make is that normally um, you can, at their other facilities, you can only buy three day passes per year um, before they say you have to get a membership to continue to use the facility, and that would not be the case in Marion. You'd be able to get unlimited day right. passes. Right. Uh, the only other thing I would comment on is having been involved in this project from, from day one, it actually started originally with 
the city and the Y sitting down to talk, and then it was broadened to include those other groups very shortly thereafter to assess what level of interest they may have in doing a joint project. As time went on, because this project was taking so long, they did choose to go off and do their own. Kirkwood decided to do a project in Hiawatha instead of a project in Marion. Linmar, of course, went on and built their own pool, but it's back to essentially the first two groups that were involved in it from day one. It was not something where those groups were all brought to the table from day one and they were all going to be participants from day one. It started with these two core, then expanded and then contracted back again. And just all right. Uh, do you have a comment? Yeah, yeah. And just, just to, I mean, we need to be clear that from the beginning, when they came uh, with forward with this project, that was one of the things that, that, that we as council asked and insisted on was that there, if there was going to be city participation, that there would be um, the ability for Marion citizens to use the facility without having to buy a membership, and they agreed right away. And, uh, you know, it's unreasonable to expect that it's going to be free usage. People don't go to the city pool for free. And there's got to be some charge, uh, and they agreed that they would have a day pass component of it that a Marion citizen could could purchase and be able to go go in and use it. And Lon has just said that it's unlimited number of day passes. So I think they've they've addressed our concern as far as making it accessible to the Marion public. Um, <clears throat> I too agree that it's unthinkable to, to, to think that you can put a 90,000 square foot facility on, on the current parcel with sufficient parking and uh, the, the land around it that's needed for ball fields and, 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 and you know, other facilities that, are, that go along with the Y. Um, I mean, it's just, you, it just can't, it's just n not imaginable, so. All right, well, we'll move on then. Uh, we have, excuse me. A comment? Yes. What are the, what's the chance of the uh, Gazette running another story with the correct information? Could we, uh, excuse me, but could we, uh, as a city, uh, put together uh, with our department uh, at, at a op-ed and send it to the city. I think that'd be the best. And we could we could correlate with you, Tim, and, and make this right. And I, okay, I appreciate it. Just answer your question, Tim. I've called the, the reporter twice, and she hasn't called me back. All righty. So now we'll move on to police. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, hope you have the memo there in front of you or close by or something. And if you uh, look, and this is a file a new job description for a confidential police administrative clerk. Right now, the police department does not have administrative clerk. The closest thing I have to a clerk is my uh, assistant to myself, which is Shalene. And what I'd like to do is substitute. We are authorized three dispatchers this year, uh, this fiscal year. I want to hire the two. I already got the two hired, actually. On the third one, not hire that person. Hire an administrative clerk. And that will save the city $5,000 minimum a year to do it that way. And the reason on both sides, the reason for the dispatcher is I really, the third one, the, the, the needs of the police department will be better served with the clerk because with the third dispatcher, that'd be on the morning shift after 3 o'clock in the morning. It's not that busy, so I can change the hours. Try to make this so it's not complicated for you guys. Change the hours. So we can, we'll be good on the morning shift but not have two to three dispatchers there at three, four, five, six o'clock in the morning when it's really not needed. Now on the other side of that with the clerk, uh, another reason why I need this clerk is because Shalene, and most people know, uh, she also does the, all the IT work for the police department. Even though we have help from the city, still half of her time, and you can talk to Terrell or anybody with IT, half her time is spent on the computers and doing IT work management, buying, uh, collecting all kinds of things when it comes to computers. And so we're falling behind with doing just regular administrative day-to-day -day operations. And with this, that would help that. Plus, I could use this person. I've asked for a record clerk in the past to help out. Uh, because of the financial, you know, we couldn't do that, but we could use her or her, him in that position. And also when we have the high profile crimes with dictation, I could also use this person, which now I can get done in a couple of weeks 
But as it is now with uh, Shalene, it may be a couple of months before we can get some of this stuff accomplished. So that's why I want to do the change. Um, like I say, it'll save the city $5,000 a year just in salary uh, to do this. If there's any questions of the council, I'll be glad to answer them. Civil service job. Right? Yes, it is. So we have, they'll have to test. We'll have to test and go through the whole thing. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Sounds good to me. All right. Glad to have you aboard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, engineering. Thanks, Your Honor. Uh, actually, under engineering, all I have is number five and six. Uh, if you have any questions about the other ones, I'd be glad to answer those. Uh, five and six is the public hearing and the accepting of bids and awarding contract for the Donnelly Park Boyson Trail Bridge. Uh, this would replace the low water crossing in Donnelly Park on Boyson Trail. Uh, on um, the 13th of the month, this month, we did receive seven actually very good sealed bids uh, on that day. The low bid was for $148,413 even from Rickliffs excavating at 71% of the engineer's estimate. Uh, work is expected to start no later than May of 16 of next year, uh, be completed in 25 working days. Uh, City Engineering Department will be doing the observation and the administration of the project uh, during the construction. We are recommending accepting the bids as presented. Comments? Good. Well, thank you. Planning? The first time, the first item, Your Honor, there's the uh, uh, Industrial Center East uh, final plat memorandum agreement for property located south of 3rd Avenue, 44th Street. This is um, uh, a part of the um, development out off of 3rd Avenue for uh, where Clinger Paint is and where APC Emirate is looking to be relocated. This is part of that uh, development agreement for relocation of uh, APC Emirate. So we'll be approving the final plat on Thursday if unless there's questions from the City Council. If you want to see a map of that, I can provide <coughs> it, but the memo was pretty detailed, I thought. Uh, number three, on uh, Thursday there's going to be a public hearing for property located at 631 Ninth Street from C1 to C2. This is uh, to establish uh, the restaurant, or I should say the uh, bar, uh, the Another Road Brewing Company, Brew Pub, at the location. Um, previously, the Pet Shop, or Railroad Warehouse, as Paul always corrects me, uh, to the relocation. Um, so they're going to be moving from their current site, which is off 12th Street behind uh, or in the building, the law building. Um, so they need to have the rezoning to provide the opportunity to sell uh, alcohol um, after 11 o'clock. Uh, the project and the proposal is certainly consistent with the city's comprehensive plan, realizing that the C2 district is going to be expanding between basically the roundabout at 7th Street to the roundabout at 15th Street. So uh, there is a public hearing on this at the meeting uh, Last week of the Planning Commission, we had uh, one resident, um, or it was actually a, a tenant in a building, uh, show up and speak against that, but nobody else did uh, speak against that proposal. So I'm not anticipating a large crowd for, for the rezoning, but it can always happen. So if we do notify out, uh, we're required to notify out 200 feet. We usually do about 300, just so we can kind of catch everybody around the neighborhood. Um, I would say from a perspective of what's around if you look to the south, uh, there's some residential uses. Uh, however, the property is zoned commercial. Um, they're just legal non-conforming uses. Uh, and then to the west, you have uh, the VIP. Um, and then to the, the north, east, you have um, Zoe's. Um, so I, th I think it's pretty consistent with the land uses in the area. And also given the growth and what we see this, the <coughs> C2 district being in the future in the uptown, I think this is consistent. So. Are there any questions regarding this project? <clears throat> Are there any uh, daycares or anything else around in that? Um, th there's no daycares that I'm aware of. Um, the only daycare uptown is the one across the street here. Okay, so so. The individual that did speak on at the Planning Commission, they own the um, uh, Christian bookstore and publishing company there to the north of the property. So he was he was opposed to the project not about this project but I do have a question about a previous project uh, the um, 
alley that was vacated and purchased by Mitchell Sutton et al. Uh, apparently there was some glitch or something that happened and the uh, county awarded him the whole alley and now the neighbors are starting to complain like crazy. Yeah. And he would like to get it uh, laid down concrete on his part, <clears throat> but he can't do anything. And uh, apparently he was told that it was a city attorney that was holding it up. We're waiting a response from Ann on that project, so. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. And now admin. Sure. Yep. Hang on a second. This is something that uh, Joe Spink suggested that we put on a work session to go back through with the city council. It's got some information that I uh, presented to the council uh, during the regular council meeting a couple of weeks ago. I uh, thought it was good information to bring back. I have added some stuff to it, but it's basically an explanation about kind of the next part of uh, city finance to talk about the city's bonding and our current indebtedness. Uh, so forgive me if some of it's old hat, but uh, I know there's some folks in the room that uh, probably haven't seen it before. Uh, in absolute numbers, the city has about uh, $56.5 million in current outstanding debt. As a percentage of our debt capacity, that's about 46.9%. The city's total bonding capacity, meaning our legal limit for what we can go out and borrow, is $120 million. So we have remaining capacity of about $63 million. When you look at the city's finance policy, the city's finance policy was originally written to preserve a dollar amount of bonding and not a percentage of bonding. Uh, as our numbers and as the community grows, the bonding capacity grows with it. So as a relative percentage, um, you know, it is a, that number looks staggering, but when you put it in context and figure out that that's less than half of what we're actually authorized to do, I don't think it appears quite so scary. <coughs> Now, historically, um, before 2007, we'd been borrowing between three and four million dollars every two years. Um, the only one that we did out of sequence was when we did borrowing for $700,000 for City Hall in 2004. Uh, at the same time, we also executed a lease for the City Hall geothermal system. Um, we're right now paying off about five million dollars a year of bonding. Um, you know the. The long and short of it is that you just cannot fit projects the scale of the police station into this kind of a bond schedule without impact. Uh, for example, the 29th Avenue bridge project, under the old bonding scenario, we actually had to borrow two consecutive bond issues to put together the local match to do that project, and that basically shot our road pro uh, construction project budget all on that one project for a period of about four years. Um, now. The reason I wanted to show you this is because, you know, as I asked the other night, the most cited need that's always listed in the citizen survey is streets. And if you take a look at what we've used these bond for, bonds for, um, $38 million of that 56 and a half has gone to streets. Um, there's been about 12.9 million put towards building projects, obviously the bulk of which was the police department, but it also included some money for the uh, new building at Thomas Park, the maintenance building and parks headquarters, and then a little bit for some of the improvements here to City Hall. There's been 14 million that's been put out towards other projects. Um, that would include things like uh, the communications upgrade that we had to do at the police department. You know, several years ago, the federal government said that we had to narrow band all of our communications and that cost Marion three million dollars out of a total Lynn County project that was more than 20 million dollars. That was just our piece, uh, something we didn't really have a choice on. There's been a million and a half that was bonded for storm sewer repairs. It also would include the purchase of the airport, um, repairs to the cemetery, park improvements, and then uh, some of the relocations on uh, Sixth Avenue for the Central Corridor project. But by far the biggest category has been streets. Now streets are something that you can further break down into uh, two different categories. You have um, what we term as regular street projects and then uh, anticipatory street projects. 
those are the ones like the extension of Tower Terrace Road from 10th to Alburnett that we've done in anticipation of development. So 31st Street South, 35th Street North, Tower Terrace from 35th Street over to Lennon Lane. These are all roads that have been put in expecting development to occur and trying to drive development to those particular areas. Um, then we've so out of that 38 million, we've put 25 million to street repair and upgrades, and the remainder has gone to anticipatory streets. If you in, and that includes the Marion Enterprise Center. So this is where we've done them, and I know that even on this screen this size, it's uh, a little hard to see. The Marion Enterprise Center is called out in blue, but you can see that um, we have done these anticipatory streets uh, pretty ecumenically. They've been done on the north side of Marion and the south side of Marion with 31st Street South, uh, the 3rd Avenue extension between 35th and 44th. We have money in there for the Armar extension that uh, assuming we can acquire the right-of-way that we need, that we'll get that one completed, and those are all intended to drive development. Some of them will do both residential and commercial. So here's ones that were specifically for commercial and industrial to try to drive that kind of growth. Um, this also shows the little pocket, the little piece of uh, 35th Street North and Tower Terrace Road where there's kind of a node of commercial there but it's primary re primarily residential around it. Now here's where I think things get, uh, from at least for a numbers geek like me, they get pretty interesting. Um, there were consequences to the city continuing to borrow the same amount that we were every other year. And that consequence was is that we were continuing to fall further and further behind on streets, which is why it was no surprise to me that um, the citizen survey every two years said we need to do more on our streets. The only times that we had ever seen dips in the public's um, support for street work was when we had done some very visible high traffic projects. So for example, if we did an overlay on 7th Avenue and we did the survey that next year, we might see a s couple of percentage point dip in public support on street work, but it's been consistent ever since. And the main reason that this has been happening is because we were borrowing the same amount, but construction inflation was eating into our ability to do it. Um, even though we were borrowing it, and in some cases even trying to up it and borrowing more money, um, the amount of actual work uh, that we were able to do kept going down because the cost of construction was increasing so much. Now here's the other component that you really have to take a look at that because in addition to being able to do less streets, the green line is the amount, is the miles of street that we were responsible for. So since Marion is a growing community, during all those years that inflation was killing us on being able to keep up on the existing road inventory, we kept adding more streets that we were becoming responsible for. So not only did we have road funding that wasn't going as far as it had in the past, we had more streets that we were trying to spread that money around on. Now this is, a, to me, a perfect example of why um, urban sprawl um, has to be complemented with infill growth. You know, going out and doing subdivisions north of Echo Hill Road is all well and good, but that's a lot of additional miles of streets, it's a lot of additional expense to get public service out there, whereas if we can drive them into places where we already have development and use infrastructure that's already in place, that's a bigger net benefit for the bottom line. Uh, a community like Marion, where we're growing as fast as we are, is never going to be able to rely on just one, but we do need to make sure that we have a mixture of both. Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk about next is, you know, what has that debt leveraged? Um, what have we used that money for? Um, over this period of time where we've uh, increased the city's debt, we have leveraged more than $21 million in grant funds. And those are funds that have generally come to the city or they've been ones that have been <laughs> applied for through places like uh, Uptown Main Street. Uh, as of last Friday, you can add another million dollars to that because the state brownfield program put a million dollars into the redevelopment of the Prince Ag site. So now we're at $22 million and counting. Uh, before that, we were matching our expenses at a 38% clip. Now, there are those people that will say, well, that's just tax dollars too, and in some cases that's true, but I will always err on the side of if those tax dollars are going to be collected and go to the state or federal government, I want them to come back to Marion versus going to somewhere else in Iowa because they are going to be spent, whether you agree with what they're spent on or not, but I would much rather have it come back and be spent locally. 
So here's all the different types of grants that we've been able to leverage with that. You can see that we've done exceptionally well with the Corridor Metropolitan Planning Organization, and I give uh, uh, Kesha and Tom's staff and Mike with the park staff uh, and Dan all the kudos in the world for all the work that they've done on leveraging uh, trails grants for us to expand that system throughout the community. Uh, with any luck, we'll add another m uh, a couple million dollars to that tally in January when we look at the functions and fitness project. I did pick out one as a sample project that I wanted to show the council. Um, I got jumped before the city council meeting last week about this project by a citizen um, who was coming at it from the standpoint that the city had wasted money replacing our uptown traffic signals only to then turn around and put in a roundabout at 7th and 7th. This is a picture of the bottom of one of the traffic signals that was at that location. And um, from this picture, it doesn't really look too bad. The next couple of pictures are going to show you the inside of what those poles like, uh, looked like. I think uh, maybe Joe might have been the only one on the council when this was happening, but um, two of them had fallen down. One of them across two lanes of traffic down by Country Kitchen. The other one in Uptown only didn't fall into traffic because it was caught by a cable line that was run between two adjoining poles. They were 10 years past their design life. They hadn't been on a regular inspection schedule. And you can see from that first picture that from the outside, they looked OK. We had actually been notified by our insurance carrier that if um, another one fell down, if it actually did hurt anyone, um, we probably didn't have coverage because we'd been given constructive notice that there was a problem with these signals. And that really exhibits the danger of not doing your research before you jump into opinions on this. Uh, the city was in a position where we had to do something about these signals. It was a clear and present danger to the public. It had to be done. It wasn't that we necessarily wanted to do it. It wasn't going in there with the intent of wasting money or putting something in that um, was going to be taken out later. We explored every possible option. Public service combed the entire state looking for other poles that we could put up. They could only find two. And uh, no new manufacturers would give us poles that would fit the existing foundations um, because the foundations didn't meet their current specs. And so they, we could have put poles on them, but they would have come with no warranty. So the city was literally put into a situation where we had to do something. Um, this is a picture of the base of one of the poles that had fallen down. And this is um, the one to the right is the base that was left after the pole fell down. So these are the types of projects that we worked on. Even on this project, with all the intersections that we replaced, um, normally this would have been a local cost. Uh, I think we did five of them, at a, and it would have cost about uh, $1 million to do that. We were able to leverage 280000 of outside dollars to help us do this project. So even that uh, was an occasion where it was something we had to do. It was going to be local cost. We still went out and found grant dollars to help pay for the cost of doing this project. Now, um, as far as the city's ability to repay debt goes, one of the major components that you have to look at is our debt service levy. This is the one that has a direct impact on everybody's property tax. Um, the, um, when we talk about the full faith and credit of the city um, for general obligation bonding, you're pledging the ability to use this levy to go out and borrow money to make sure that you can make your debt payments. It's one of the reasons why we have such a strong uh, credit rating is because our utilization of this levy, as you can see, over time has historically been very steady. Um, it's been as low as $1.79, and it's been as high as $2.51, but the average is $2.16. Um, in the current budget, it's $2.19. So we're within three cents of the average, even with the increased rate of borrowing that we've been doing. Um, know, from 2000 to 1 to 2007, our taxable value grew about 48%, and from now, from then until now, it's been 37%. That's a big part of why we've been able to keep this number pretty consistent over the years. Um, our taxable value is getting larger, the city is growing, and we have simply more capacity to borrow. Now, those maps that I showed you earlier, I wanted to sh uh, go back to those and kind of show, because the question keeps coming up about who's paying for all this, who's paying for all this additional debt. These are the roads that we put in in anticipation of development, with the uh, blue one being the Marion Enterprise Center. 
Now, the, um, the next map is going to show you where Marion's really hot <coughs> areas of residential growth have been since 2007. Now, this isn't going to be exhausted because there have been some other areas like uh, on the other side of 13 that have done well, Bridge Creek Addition that have done well. But if you take a look, there's a very strong correlation between us putting streets in and residential development following in those areas. Uh, Irish Drive is a success story that I wish we could replicate everywhere. That area is just building houses and selling them off as fast as they can they can put them up. Uh, these other ones, um, John Morris's project out off of Tower Terrace Road has done exceptionally well. Uh, 31st Street South, um, that's one I'm very happy with because if we hadn't put those streets in, they were going to run into a really tough time continuing to develop in Marion Independent School District. Uh, the fire code has a limitation that if you have a street going into a subdivision, you can only have 100 houses. They were getting to the point where they were going to have to stop developing because they didn't have other easy outlets. 31st Street gave them the ability to put that outlet in and to continue to develop houses in that area. It helps their tax base and it helps bring new residents to the community. Now here, if we take a look at the uh, map that I had of the commercial and industrial development around the community, you'll see a similar correlation. Now again, you know, these are a little hard to see because they're the little um, green stars, but these are projects in Marion that were in excess of a million dollars. You know, there's certainly going to be other ones that have been done in Marion that didn't follow along these routes, but you know, the bulk of the ones, particularly all of the large ones, have occurred along areas where we have put these streets in in advance of development. So, you know, going back to 2008 when the comprehensive plan only identified two parcels north of 10th Avenue for commercial development, we fixed that impediment to business growth. We've put in streets, and um, as of today, I could put one more little star down there in the Marion Enterprise Center with the groundbreaking. If I included 6th Avenue as one of our street projects, then uh, the entire Lincoln View area would be on this list as well. So the question becomes about who pays. It's the homes in these areas and the businesses in these areas are the ones paying that additional debt. That's why that $2.19 has been able to stay, stay so steady. Even though we're paying more, we're paying $5 million a year, it goes back to these residents and businesses. Um, one question that I wanted to address with council was about voting on borrowing. Um, this has been something that's been made an election issue. Uh, I think it's my responsibility to make sure that the council knows about the laws that you have to work under, not necessarily the laws that you wish you have in place. Um, but basically, as far as being able to put a question out there about, you know, should we expand the library? The city, frankly, just can't do that. Iowa's law is exclusionary. Iowa's law only allows items that are specified in the state code that are required to be put on the ballot to be put on the ballot. And as much as people might want to do something else, you simply can't legally do it. If the legislature wants to change that, we would happily follow the new law. Um, but the attorney general's opinion goes one step further and even says that um, if you want to do something, that's an advisory opinion, not something that the state code says that you could put on the ballot. You cannot use public funds to do that. So a couple of final thoughts uh, on it. Uh, there's no doubt that the uh, debt is higher. That's something that uh, I think was deliberate. I didn't even get into the last 18 million of debt that we issued that was primarily to benefit the school districts. That was a case where we had development agreements in place and private sector businesses were doing borrowing on our behalf under annual appropriation agreements. Um, we took the debt on directly because we could cut the interest rate more than in half and because we could change the payment schedule to release taxable value to benefit both of the school districts and help them hold their property tax rates down. Um, but we are in the lowest interest rate environment that we've seen in 40 years. Uh, I took one project, the biggest one, the police department, and took our actual 2005 bond issue and then our 2013 bond issue to compare the interest rates to see what the difference was in those projects. And these are actual borrowings. Um, $832,000 in interest savings by doing the borrowing for that project when we did. The first year note on that 
police station was at 1.15% interest, which is just absolutely phenomenal. And then uh, finally, as I said before, our taxable value is up is up by 37%. Um, this has happened. Uh, Marion has continued to grow while other similar communities to us stalled during the economic recession. Um, some communities like Waukee flatlined for a year or two when they had a lot of their large builders go under. Um, Marion has been fortunate enough to have large builders and small builders who were more prudent with their finances than Regency Homes were and have been able to continue to develop in our community um, during this period of time. Um, I think it's pretty significant in because, um, you know, from 2000 to 2007, our taxable value grew by $323 million, which is a number that a lot of communities in Iowa would absolutely kill for. Um, but from 2007 to 2014, it's grown $433 million during one of the worst economies in American history. And I think that's because we have made strategic investments and we have used our ability to uh, finance to drive investment in the community. So, yeah. Are there any questions? I, I, I couldn't help but to wonder, Lon, my former life, is there any product liability on those light, on those light poles? They were were they put in improperly or were they designed improperly or no it was just a function of the material they were uh, cast iron poles I believe and they just rusted over time in that environment they were past their design life uh, by several years and so I mean they if I remember right they had a 20 year design life and I think they were 27 years old when we took them out. The thing that surprised me the most was that I would have just assumed that you could go back to another manufacturer and buy poles and put on those bases, but everyone that we talked to said that we won't give you a warranty if you do that. And we didn't want to make that kind of investment in that kind of a system without having a warranty on it. A product liability doesn't have a shelf life, though. It's a hammer that was made 50 years ago. Uh, they can still be held liable for it. Right? Yeah, I'd have to look and see. Um, I think we did explore that, but I'm not sure what the resolution to it was. It's been Thank long you. enough ago. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, go ahead. Uh, so the, uh, the question of uh, putting a vote out, uh, the city can't do it, but can the library board do that? Are they under the same restrictions? The library board is under the same restrictions, um, but... Uh, you know, they do have a couple of other alternatives. The public funds can't be spent to use that, so they couldn't use the library budget. If the library foundation wanted to fund something like that, they'd have the ability to do that. Um, but we also um, can, when the library project is finally ultimately put together and they have one they can put in front of the public, we'll structure the financing in such a way that it would allow for a vote. Uh, as long as you are going to borrow $701,000, you can put a put a, a project out to a vote. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ready for the next one? Okay. Uh, this is something that I wanted to have a discussion with the council. Um, we've been having some discussions between the city and involving Medco and uh, just taking a look at some of the issues that have cropped up with tax increment financing over the years, but before we embarked on doing a, re a rewrite of our TIF policy, I wanted to make sure that the council was supportive of some of the changes. Um, what we're doing, the policy that we're using now was actually adopted in uh, 1994. And at the time, it's clear if you read it that it was written uh, under the economic development um, theory of the time, which was basically going out and chasing big companies that were going to bring in lots of jobs and capital investment, uh, kind of the old model of what they term smokestack chasing. It, it was not really set up to uh, contemplate other projects uh, that really lean towards the commercial side of things, but are jobs that people would really like to have in their community. You know, the examples that I use for that are ones like ESCO and Involta, where they're professional services firms, um, but they are clearly more commercial than they are industrial. Uh, 
under that policy, our base award amount for a project is five years and 100% of a tax rebate, you know, rebating the, in, the uh, new taxes that are created by the developer completing the project or the business completing the project. We can tinker around with those terms a little bit, but we always do a calculation to make sure that the net present value is close to that five years, 100%. Council does have some flexibility in the policy based on looking at the project and like quality of jobs, quantity of jobs um, to go beyond that level. We have done that on some projects. I believe we did that with um, the St. Luke's Lebeda redevelopment. Uh, we did that on ESCO. We did that on Involta. Uh, went a little bit beyond those parameters. Uh, as far as the current process, we get a request from the developer, council receives and files it. Um, we do a resolution directing the staff to negotiate an agreement. Then we go through the state mandated process. We have our consultation session with the other taxing entities, set our hearing for the urban renewal plan amendment and the hearing on, on the agreement, sign the documents that are approved by council and then go ahead and record them. Here's what we see, I think, from the staff side is the issues with the way that we're doing it now. Uh, it, we do everything we can under the current policy to document what we call the, what's called the but for test. The but for test shorthand means that but for the city putting the money in, the project wouldn't proceed in the way that it's proposed. It has to meet that to be eligible under, under state law. Um, there are some other things that drive the amount that developers are asking for. Uh, competition is a big one. Um, in recent years, really the last five years, Cedar Rapids has loosened up considerably for projects in strategic areas around the community and has gone uh, as far as 10 years, 100% on mixed use projects, um, sometimes even more than that, depending on the project that they're looking at. Uh, very large incentives for projects the scale of the Westdale development, the Fountains development, uh, the project that Berthel Fisher is moving into over near uh, Transamerica. And that competition brings them to Marion expecting to see something similar. And we always hear, well, if you don't do it or don't match it, we're just going to go to Cedar Rapids. Uh, we're also to take a look at past practice to make sure that we're trying to be consistent with what we've done for similar projects in the past. Um, because we're only doing the letter of request, uh, then we have to request data afterwards to try to verify the amount of assistance that it's really going to take to get the project off the ground. And all of those incentives are the same in all the different TIF districts. So with those issues, there are some areas that specifically we think we need to address. Uh, we need to do better verification of the but for test and then do a specific determination of need. I think the gold standard in this area is probably Iowa City. They have a very robust application that, company, uh, that uh, companies have to fill out and, and turn in. They actually contract with an outside firm to do a full financial review with the company and then come back to them and say this is the amount that you need to put in in order to make the project work under these conditions. Um, we have equity issues. Um, what I mean by that is that um, a company could come into a building along the central corridor, for example, and put $75,000 into it and not feel like they're going to be eligible for any type of assistance. Um, whereas somebody who is four blocks down the street but comes in and asks might be able to receive something. So there's an equity issue there. Um, and finally, the districts were established for different reasons. You know, the Tower Terrace West District and the 29th Avenue uh, District were established for the express purpose of putting in Tower Terrace Road, whereas the Central Corridor District was established, or excuse me, the Marion Commerce Corridor District now was established for very different reasons. So what we would propose is that we establish some new criteria, um, completely revamp our application uh, to get it at least to the level of what you would have to fill out if you were doing a revolving loan fund loan. It would be similar information to what the business already has to put together for the bank. So we're not asking them to do a whole lot of extra work just to complete it on our forms. Um, we would want to see a pro forma for the project. Um, one of the things that we would want to do with this process is to define the acceptable rate of return. Um, in our area, it seems like uh, cash on cash rate of return, for example, on an uptown building project should return between 8 and 12 percent. 
to the developer. If they bring in a pro forma that's got it at 21%, well, then they probably don't need the amount of assistance that they're asking for. Um, we also need to be careful to make sure that um, we're not going to put them in jeopardy with their bank as the primary financing source. So there's other criteria like debt coverage ratio that the bank's going to want to uh, see during the life of the project. We'll take a look at that too in determining the appropriate amount of assistance for a project. Then you'd have the ability to tailor incentives to the the district. So, um, for example, in the Central Corridor, if you want to encourage mixed-use, multi-story projects, the TIF policy could cre be crafted in such a way so that, you know, one, you come in for a conventional one-story in an area that's been identified as wanting to go vertical, one story doesn't qualify or it only qualifies for a basic or minimal assistance, but if you go up, you would get maybe a height bonus. That's what Iowa City does to encourage uh, more compact development on a site is provide height bonuses based on how far up the building goes. Um, would want to get away from economic development grants. Uh, that's something that you've seen in the last couple of development agreements that we've considered is taking a look at um, converting those over to loans instead so that it's repaid to the community rather than being a grant that we recover from property taxes. Um, that's not actually a strange new thing for Marion. Um, in reviewing the records, the city uh, actually made a loan to a direct loan to help with the Hunter's Ridge development project, and that was repaid over a period of years. But then the most critical thing from my standpoint is that needs test to say, okay, prove to us that you need it. Don't just come over here and say, I want to do this project like this one I did in Cedar Rapids, but kind of forget that that land in Cedar Rapids cost you $3 million and in Marion it cost you a $1 million. The incentive amount doesn't have to be the same in Marion to make the project move forward. So I'll use the uh, central corridor as an example where we might be able to do some targeted investment. And this one I picked on specifically because when we established this, it replaced what's called a tax revitalization district. And under a tax revite district, anybody who did any physical improvements to their property would have been eligible to receive a tax abatement on the value created by those improvements. It would have been automatic. They would have brought the application to the city council. The city council would have approved it. It would have been filed with the county, and they would have been off to the races mm -hmm. with their 10-year phase in on the new property taxes. At the time we replaced that tax revitalization district, the council said we will look at something similar for... Uh, businesses that make investments using the urban renewal law, which is rebates instead of abatement. So they pay the taxes and then we rebate the money back. Um, but in a corridor like this, you also not only replace that revitalization district, but this is an area where we've got a lot of brownfields that we're trying to make sure that the playing field is level between here and other greenfield areas like Tower Terrace Road so that people will want to continue to invest in the central corridor. So with a district like this, what we could contemplate is saying, okay, we will do a blanket finding that there is a public purpose behind investments in this district because we are eliminating slum and blight and we are remediating brownfields. So we develop a boundary and say businesses that do projects in these boundaries, all businesses or property owners that do projects in these boundaries can qualify for these types of incentives. So for example, you know, a project up to $250,000, maybe the city council just says you can qualify for three years, 100% of tax rebates. It takes a lot of the work out of the staff side. It becomes something that the real estate community can use as a selling tool when they've got somebody coming in contemplating looking at a building that needs to put $100,000 into it. They know what it is, and it's just ready to go. And then stratify that. Um, so maybe from 500 to t from 250 to 500,000, you get five years 100%, and 500 to 750, you get seven years 100%, or something along those lines. I mean, just that's kind of the concept that we've been playing around with, is tying the incentives based on those levels of investment. And then finally, uh, one of the things, if any of you have had a chance to read the book that we provided on strategic planning called The Advantage, one of the um, core uh, values that he talks about in there is making sure that um, whoever you're doing business with reflects your values as an organization. 
And to that end, um, I think to make sure that we're dealing with people who exemplify Marion's values, we would implement <coughs> background checks on the principals involved with the corporations and that uh, if they don't um, walk the walk of the values that the community of Marion has, they're just simply ineligible for assistance. So there's a lot of work that would still need to be done on actually writing the policy, but I wanted to, you know, I said, I didn't want to go to a whole bunch of work to write it if the council wasn't going to be supportive of these kinds of changes. Is there assistance that the league offers for writing things, the League of Cities? The league has a lot of information on this, and uh, they will collect different TIF policies used by communities. So they have kind of an information library of best practices used by other communities. And then uh, you're talking about this outside company or uh, working with Iowa City. Uh, who pay? Does the city pay for that, or is that part of the uh, the, the person applying for it? The city has a, a standard annual contract with that company up to, I think, $26,000 for general economic development assistance services. But then um, if a business comes in and makes an application for TIF assistance, they pay for that cost. The city bills it back to them. Okay. The applicant pays for it? The applicant pays for it. And on big projects, it can be pretty pricey. Now, Iowa City is a little different because they're dealing with 20 and 30 story building proposals that I really can't fathom that we'd ever see things like that come into Marion. Uh, I plan on visiting with uh, Scott Swenson over at the uh, uh, Business Development Center to see if that's something that he might be able to provide. He does a lot of work with local businesses doing reviews for programs like the SBA that would have similar criteria to what we're talking about here. Um, he's very experienced at doing it and he's local. So the developers are okay with giving out the, their, essentially telling what they're going to do to a private company then and I guess there there's are some security that has to be there. Yeah, there are some issues that you can have with competitive advantage. Um, the, under the open records law, you are allowed to keep things confidential if the, the revelation of that information would be prejudicial to the company, meaning that it would give a competitor information that they could use to the detriment of that company. That's one of the reasons why Iowa City does it the way that they do, they do is that all of that information, instead of going to the city, is given over to the uh, NDC, the National Development Corporation, that they use as their contractors. So as the, the NDC can do all of that review, and not being a public entity in Iowa isn't subject to those same standards. But this is uh, generally all the same type of information that they would have been giving us back in the days when we had the revolving loan fund or Medco had the revolving loan fund. Uh, so I don't think there's anything in it that's going to be earth shattering. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm all for the uh, background checks and the financial checks to make sure that the uh, uh, developer, whoever's doing the project, has the wherewithal to actually complete it and, and do it properly. Um, I think that's, that's a necessity when we're investing public funds in the project. And... Um, you know, I, and I think that the city should have a say in what the project looks like and, and, and to expect the best product from, from that developer. So I, I think this is, this is a positive direction. Well, and if we considered a uh, sunset on the sale of properties that have been tipped, uh, just because the person who does the project himself there isn't any reason to believe in three years if he sells it that the new owner should be eligible for the tip. Yeah, that's actually something that can be written into the development agreements as far as whether or not the, debt, the TIF benefits can be assigned to someone else. Uh, that can be something that is an issue, uh, like if you do a 10-year agreement. Um, Sometimes people will try to monetize the value of the TIF incentive and try to tack it on to the selling price of the, of the building, and that's not really the case. I mean, the ones that we write, we have the ability to say yes or no on the ability to assign that. So um, it's not necessarily a case, you know, we may be perfectly comfortable with the company that comes in and does the project, but if they're going to turn around and sell it to someone who, for example, wouldn't pass the test and the background checks to have been eligible to begin with, then we wouldn't allow that to be assigned. Thank you. Anything else? 
Thank you. Next. Uh, number four is a resolution uh, for establishing reserve parking zones. Um, these are related to the Uptown Alley project. Um, we've gotten all of the signed easement agreements that we need for that. Uh, the condition of the one with the Iowa Realty and the Shermco buildings was to replace the parking that they were lo they were going to be losing by designating it for their use during working hours. There's a couple of spaces on the 10th Street side and then some over on the 11th Street side. Uh, I think we've shown the council the map on where those affected spaces would be before. Um, we have uh, sent notices out to the adjoining properties of that contemplated change, but we're at the point where we actually need to do the resolution to establish that. And then number five is a resolution for the uh, public hearings on the Marion Commodore's Corridor Urban Renewal Plan. This was related to the Coben Hervey Building Project with Franz Community Investors. And I will give Franz a lot of credit. Um, you know, I had talked with them ahead of time about the potential changes to our TIF policy, and uh, they are happily complying with the standards that uh, we want to have in place, even though they are not yet in place. They've been very open about their project. Back on four, number four line, mm -hmm. is that something that we might want a public hearing on about the parking? We notified the effect, the affected properties, so uh, if, if folks have concerns about it, they'll have the opportunity to weigh in on it um, while the resolution is up for consideration. Okay. Any other comments? Thank you. Okay. We're adjourned. Do we have, do we have something going on now? What do we have, we have now? We have the uh, reception with the school board members and the superintendents were also invited out in the uh, atrium at 530. It's a social mixer. Um, we did put an agenda out for it, but there's no official business. It would just be a call to order and an adjourn.